Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. International Women's Day is upon us, an opportunity to consider to what extent the lot of women has changed and what more changes are needed. I have the pleasure of doing just that today with a woman who's spent a great deal of time thinking about it and indeed writing about it, Anna, Hannah Rosen, who is an author and journalist and has written a book uh, called uh, The End of Men and the Rise of Women. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. First of all, the title, the title of the book suggests that it is a zero-sum game. It does suggest that. I mean, the title is meant to be provocative. It's meant to provoke an emotional reaction in people. I'm not sure that it's a zero-sum game. I more think it's a continuum and sort of men can become adaptable and catch up as well. So, so it's not really a zero-sum game, I would but, say. But the, the basic premise is that what, it began with an absence. You noted that, noticed, noticed that the men simply weren't around. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you found as you investigated further. Yes, it started as an economic argument. I know that was the time when men were really losing their jobs in great numbers in the recession, and it seemed to me that women were adapting a little better to this new economy. Uh, and then what happened is, uh, as I started researching this, I realized that it wasn't just an economic story. It wasn't just about skills and adaptability and degrees. It was also about how these changes were affecting our intimate relationships and the decisions that we make about love and marriage and having children and all kinds of very close decisions. So the book begins with me following a particular couple and noticing the power dynamic in their relationship. And basically, every chapter is told through the story of a woman or a couple who is going through these changes that I describe. Because the, the changes do uh, that, you, that you suggest are taking place are profound. It isn't simply, as some feminists had argued in the beginning of the early 1990s, for instance, that women had caught up. It is, in fact, that they have shot ahead. And you, you end up with these two characters, plastic woman and cardboard uh, man. And the lot of men seems actually quite catastrophic. Yeah, that that concept is, is is intended to embody this idea that the key quality that women have over the course of the century is adaptability and flexibility. So what you need to survive in this economy changes all the time because technology will make certain things obsolete. But what women seem to be willing to do is get the skills and degrees that they need uh, in order to catch up to what the economy is asking them to do. I think the problem with men is that they've always been on top. They've always had a certain amount of privilege. And so um, it's always the people at the bottom who are more adaptable and flexible. I, the, the word that is constantly coming to my mind lately is this idea of disruptive technology. Like, that's how women are behaving these days. Almost like, think about Apple computers, women being the Apple computers of the economy. It's a smaller uh, firm. It's the underdog initially. But then it seems to be better attuned to what the world is asking, and then suddenly it races ahead. So it's something like that. And indeed, the result seems to be, and it's the case of Bethany, the first protagonist in your book, and when one considers, looks around one, the case of a lot of women one knows, they simply seem to be able to dispense with men altogether. Uh, it's a controversial argument. How has it been received? What's the reaction to the argument been? Uh, well, I will say, um, you know, the, the good part, the, the hopeful ending is not that we dispense with men altogether, me as a person with a husband and two sons and a father, et cetera, like many of you out there. Uh, the, the argument is hopefully that men adapt and sort of we find some way to work together. My, my hopeful model is something I call the seesaw marriage, where men and women are taking places. That's something that we see a lot among elite couples, and it's actually been a very successful model for marriage these days. Um, but in terms of the reaction I've gotten all over the board, uh, surprisingly, I've gotten more resistance from women sometimes than from men, women who don't like this term, the end of men, because they feel like, well, that's not what my workplace is like or that's not what my marriage is like. Um, and I think women have more of a habit of kind of speaking up and debating these issues. I mean, we see it now over Sheryl Sandberg's new book, Lean In, and what's going on with the women of Silicon Valley. Like, we have a, we have a habit of kind of fighting hard over the role of women in society. And so, so maybe it's not surprising that I've gotten more pushback from one, women. One of the most interesting, I thought, points that you make is that it, perhaps what it shows us is that despite what we'd always thought, uh, the world is not as it is because men are as they are and women as they are. One of your conclusions seems to be, in fact, uh, that these changes show us that uh, it is uh, that things are as they are and that people adapt. 
Yeah, I mean, I think people like to think that we are fixed, and particularly genders are fixed. Now, I'm not saying that there are not things that are essentially feminine and essentially masculine, and I think the more we learn about the brain and biology, the more we'll discover that there are differences between men and women. But I think more interesting than the differences are, A, the similarities, and B, the degree to which we can move and change in response to our society. Uh, one chapter in my book, which is a kind of, you know, curveball chapter, talks about women becoming more violent, because I think as women become more powerful, they take on some of the traits of the powerful. So this idea we have that women are eternally, you know, nice, empathetic, feminine, well, it turns out that we move pretty far along that continuum. I mean, just think about what it was unacceptable for a woman to do, you know, 80, 50, 60 years ago, and what women are doing now. It's a vast difference. Now, of course, the, the book uh, deals, uh, as one reads it, one can't help but think that it does uh, uh, apply to um, the Western world. You can see that it is the case uh, amongst uh, amongst people that you know in America and Europe. The rest of the world, of course, uh, presents uh, yet another series of problems. And uh, we're talking, uh, it, is, it is the time for International Women's Day and, of course, an opportunity to look at all the gaps that continue to exist. And the figures are uh, extraordinary when you look at them worldwide. Two-thirds of all children denied uh, school are girls um, of 188 directly elected elected leaders, only 16 are women. And I could go on. The facts and figures are absolutely astonishing uh, and are surprisingly indicative that a huge gap, despite how far we've come in some countries, how huge the gap remains elsewhere. That's true. And I think that the changes I'm describing are jagged, but I would argue that the, the the foundation of what I'm saying is true almost all over the world. And so you see situations where women are trying to get educa educated, and education is considered dangerous. I mean, we see that in the Middle East. I used to go around saying, oh, well, this is true everywhere, but, you know, oppressed countries are in the Middle East. And then I would get letters from women. I got one from a reading group in Gaza the other day who told me, look, we've been reading this book, and we're all better educated here now. And so we have the option to choose our mates and to refuse men if we want to. It's like some portion of these changes are happening all over the world, even though on paper the world looks very patriarchal. One of my chapters takes place in South Korea, and I specifically chose South Korea because it is an extremely patriarchal society and remains an extremely patriarchal society. And yet you've had this feminist revolution happen in a course of 15 years, largely because of education and industrialization. And so you have this, again, disruptive force of women rising up and basically throwing throwing the society off balance. And you, I think you have some elements of that happening throughout the world. And then it just depends how, how hard people react. I mean, the girl who was, the young girl who was shot at in Afghanistan, uh, and, and you mentioned some of these countries, uh, it's because she was seeking education. Um, and I think she's looking around even at Arab countries, a place like Saudi Arabia, which built tons of universities. Well, even in Saudi Arabia, women get more college degrees than the men do. So things are changing. Th things are changing, but of course, quite slowly in some countries, you, you mentioned uh, the Arab world. World, we've seen this extraordinary hope expressed by many women who took part in the uh, the Arab Spring and the revolutions that we saw uh, there. I in a sense, express a certain amount of disappointment since that things have not moved uh, more quickly. You point out in the book that uh, perhaps what's surprising is that uh, things have happened as quickly as they have in some parts of the world, and we've al they've almost happened without us realizing. But there is a a an equivalent slowness really elsewhere. I guess that I don't think of it as quickness and slowness, because I don't think history works that way. I think it just throws us surprises. So it's quite jagged. I mean, you even see it in the U.S. There are segments of society and professions where women have zoomed forward and taken over. There are other places where things feel like as retrograde as they ever were. So I think, you know, we can't assume that history moves in one direction or another. It's not a steady march forward, and it's not a permanent stuckness. It's some kind of jaggedness that we can, as a society, sort of push against at some level and sometimes it just washes over us. And of course, one can imagine that, uh, uh, assuming these changes continue in the direction that you suggest, uh, the changes uh, to society are going to be profound, but for now, unpredictable, unimaginable. Yes, that's exactly how I feel about it. I would walk around some parts of America, or even South Korea for that matter, and I would think, wow, this is a world turned upside down. The way that the this man and this woman relate to each other, the way the society is functioning now as opposed to the way it functioned 15, 20 years ago, it is a world turned upside down. And then you'd walk to other places and you'd think, wow, men are really still in charge here. 
It is perhaps surprising that it hasn't been, it is, does seem such a profound change. And in so many ways, reading your book, one is surprised by how uh, true so much of it seems. And I found myself thinking how curious that this hasn't been picked up on uh, before. Were you surprised? I think that it's the argument is still resisted. I mean, I think we've had a long history, particularly as women, as being second class. You know, the Simone de Beauvoir label still sticks with us. I think there's many ways in that in which that's still true, especially for educated women. Uh, there's many ways in which we cling to the old ways in, in, of seeing ourselves. I think that's partly the way women are socialized, their personalities. There's still a discomfort with the idea of women in power and women being aggressive and dominant. It's something we're working out as a society. I mean, again, I bring up Sheryl Sandberg's new book, Lean In. I mean, this idea of women sort of, you know, being successful, sort of taking what they want and deserve in the workplace still has to be voiced, and it still makes us some somewhat uncomfortable. So I think that's that's what explains the different psychological reactions, that even though you might see it, especially as a young woman in your life, you know, with your boyfriends, in the dating scene, in your workplace, in college, you might see it everywhere. There's still a kind of dissonance to the, to the, to the vision of women in that role in society. Well, I hope that on future Women's Day, uh, you'll be back uh, again with your next books on the subject uh, to tell us uh, what you found as these things continue to evolve. Uh, thank you very much indeed, thank Hannah you. Rosen, for having uh, joined us today. That brings us to the end of today's interview, but we'll be back very soon for another here on France 24. Do join us then. Bye-bye.